Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 33, Regrets, I've Had a Few. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean Stevens, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. Today, after our Kickstarter-based main topic, I'm going to be talking about the master of Orion board game, a new Numenera board game, Sagrada and Villages of Valeria. And I've got a lot of board game arena and one disastrous Hogwarts battle. Ooh, that does not sound good. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. We're here for you. Each week, we're going to highlight some of those discussions, feedback we've received, comments on our content, gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. We've got some comments on the two reviews we released last week. Stefan Beal on G Plus wrote about Jim Henson's Labyrinth. It does a great job of invoking the nostalgia of the film, but mechanically, I couldn't bring myself to table it a second time. Yeah, thanks, Stefan, or Steven. I plan to play my copy exactly one more time. And that's only to get the Goblin expansion off my pile of shame. After that, we'll prob- we may even donate the game and take the minis out of it. I don't know. At that point, it's, it's, we don't need the box anymore. Phil Hatfield on G Plus wrote, Yeah, I heard it was disappointing in play, but with the great minis, I had to unrecommend a person from the game. Unless they just wanted the fancy minis. And now I've seen they have oversized minis for the game. Thanks, Phil. Giant size minis for a bad game? Hey, why not double down on what they did right, I guess? Now, James Eddy wrote about our Shadow of the Demon Lord review. I kickstarted Shadow of the Demon Lord because I was impressed with the type of world he was laying out. However, on receiving the rulebook, I was similarly impressed by how simple the system was and how character focused it was. The other supplements really do enhance the game as well with more expert and master paths, magic schools, an in-depth look at the various ancestries. Overall, it is one of a few games that has come out in the past five years that I haven't regretted buying into. Nice. Uh, Thanks for the comment, James. I'm glad to see I'm not the only one that was impressed by Shadow of the Demon Lord. Uh, After posting that review, I got quite a bit, especially interaction on Twitter, people recommending the system. It seems like it definitely has a following. Now here's some more praise from Reverence Pavane. Again, about Shadows of the Demon Lord. It's good. But the really nice thing are the expansions and supplements, and I cannot recommend them enough. A Speciable Terrible Beauty, Fairy, and Hunger in the Void, which details the Demon Lord. The cosmology they describe is brilliant, but definitely moves away from that implied Warhammer setting, and best known only by the Game Master. There are lots of optional rules and forbidden rules which are worth investigating. The Boon Bane system works very well. A Boon is a D6 that gets added to your D20 wall while a Bane gets subtracted. However, Boons and Banes simply cancel out. And if you have multiple Boons or Banes, only the highest roll counts. This very neatly limits extreme dice rolls from bonuses, much the same way advantage and disadvantage can constrains rolls in 5th edition, edition D&D. I did get some custom D6s made up for Shadow of the Demon Lord, so that the Boom Bane bonus was 0 to 5 rather than 1 to 6 because I'm a cruel games master. <laughs> yeah, it applies to the bad guys and the good guys too, though, so that's going to affect both your sides. Uh, he goes on. The game is intentionally designed so that leveling is automatic and proceeds according to the number of adventurers the players have performed. Most of the public adventures are quite reasonable. The ultimate reason for this is that it's expected that the players will face the, de- face the Demon Lord when they reach 10th level, and the story will finish. My only real complaint is that canonically, spells are too limited as. Whilst there is quite a selection, players 
only get to have very few of them, which limits play somewhat, especially at higher levels. I would have preferred a mechanism where magic comes at a cost to learn, more so than just for black magic, and that it can be learned separately from character advancement and gained as treasure in legendary tomes and grimoires, with level advancements providing resistance to the innately corrosive effects of knowing magic. Either that or something like the 13th Age mechanic where spells evolve as the character level increases. Now, personally, I've heard how good the supplements are from quite a few people. Now, I'm currently reading Demon Lord's Companion for my RPG a month book for March, and I'll be letting everyone know my thoughts on that when I finish it. Well, it sounds to me a lot like that magic mechanic is very much like the old Warhammer one, mm -hmm. where magic is just very special. It's so incredibly rare, even for a mage who has just managed to tap into that sort of the edge of the of that that, mm -hmm. that flow of magic. Um, and that's, that's, you know, for people who are used to magic in a lot of other systems, yeah. I'm sure that's a, a major, uh, a difference in why people would want to seek out, uh, more in different magic to be able to, to really sort of dig their teeth into magic itself. Yeah, I totally agree. For last week's Throwback Thursday, Mo reposted one of our earliest Ask the Bellhop articles, giving two player game recommendations. And we got a couple of comments on that. Nathan V on Pluspoor writes... I still want to find out if Magic the Gathering Arena of Planeswalkers is a good two-player game. I can say Skipbo is not a fun two-player game, not when I am the other player. Alas, against me, Skipbo is at best an exhausting game, and at worst, depressing. My instinct at that game is, to, is far too competitive for my own good. Well, Nathan, you should be happy to know that Arena of the Planeswalkers, or Arena of the Planeswalkers, yeah, is actually best with two players. It plays up to four, but once you play four players, it's just someone gets ganged up on, or it's a team-based game, and it's not that great. Uh, it is a decent game. I rather enjoyed it. It's the evolution of Heroescape, but it's sadly dead. It died before it really got started. It was put out by Woods of the Coast, and now you can find it for like $5 in discount bins. They only put out the main game and two expansions, one of which was standalone. It's kind of sad it didn't go anywhere. Now, Skippo, I haven't tried, but thanks for the tip. I'll make sure to keep it that way. Now, while I haven't played it in ages, my wife and kids love Skippo. Uh, it's basically Uno meets Gin Rummy. Uh, so I suspect that Nathan is probably just not into that head-to-head -head competitive, uh, you know, cut cutthroat sort of one-on-one uh, -on -one game. Now, he noted it's not good with two players. Is it a game that generally you play with more? I don't actually know Skip Bo. Well, again, it, it's it's Uno meets Gin Rummy. So you've got that, you know, when you've got more players, the effects are yeah. just beating on each other. So That makes sense. Stuntman, also on Plus Pour Up also commented on that two-player blog post, but this time with a positive recommendation. My favorite two-player only game right now is Techno Bowl. It's a game based on American football. I love how you set up your own formations and draw up your own plays. It's a game that feels so much like football. Nothing else I've seen comes close. Well, thanks, Stuntman. We've got one more comment this time on YouTube about our Gloomhaven FAQ review. This one is from Tem uh, Temujin, who writes, Interesting video. I'm following along with you guys, and it's neat to see this kind of discussion about how you integrate the FAQ into your game group. Uh, around the 29-minute mark, you discuss ambiguity with attack modifier cards. In this case, it's not a case of where players get to choose. When you attack with either advantage or disadvantage, and the two cards drawn are ambiguous, you must apply the first card you drew, this is mentioned in the ambiguous or tied situation section. For example, if you draw a plus zero muddle and then a 2x, you must use the plus zero muddle. Well, thanks, Temujin. Um, as I mentioned many times during the live stream, if you see us messing something up, please point it out. That's a good catch on your part. We did miss that. So we saw the part that said, in case of ambiguity where players decide the outcome, it's up to you. I saw that. I even went back and went, yeah, that's what we had read. But we somehow totally we somehow totally missed the next part that specifically says, note that ambiguity with respect to attack modifier cards drawn for advantage, disadvantage are not decided by the player. The rule book states how to resolve that. Use the first drawn card. So we totally missed that. We read the first part of that paragraph that was like, players decide. I'm like, oh, great. Why are there so many ambiguous ones? And then totally forgot to read the rest of the sentence. Our bad. Thank you for pointing that out. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. 
Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that might make it on YouTube. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Tonight in the chat, we have Shadzar, Poncho72, Major Kayla, and Vorpal Wombat is joining us. Excellent. Good to hear. So today's main topic is going to be Kickstarter regrets. I think everyone who's backed a few Kickstarters has at least one project they probably wish they hadn't backed. Similarly, I know most gamers, even people who have never used Kickstarter, tend to have at least one project they somewhat regret not taking part in. What I want to hear is about those projects. What are your Kickstarter regrets? We'll be back checking in with the chat room multiple times throughout the show. Now, I did see Shadzar had mentioned Tech Mobile. That is actually a different game. This is a board game, Tech No Bowl, and Tech is written N-O-B-O-W-L. Uh, it's a game that's often compared to Blood Bowl. Now, everyone calls Blood Bowl fantasy football. I played much of Blood Bowl. Blood Bowl really isn't football. There's very little football-like in it. Uh, from what I can tell, it's closest to rugby, if you had to tie it to a real sport, because it's there's scrums and... I don't know. It, it's to me not that much of a football game. Whereas Tech Mobile, Tech No Bowl is actually trying to recreate NFL uh, in as much as possible. Most episodes, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. Uh, we're pretty much everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop One Word. Even on MeWe now, they finally let us edit it and it's no longer Tabletop hyphen Bellhop. We are Tabletop Bellhop One Word. As far as I know, pretty much everywhere now. Well, the best way for or questions to get to me is through the website because then they go into my inbox, then they get logged and tagged and I get a notification. I'm not going to say no if you ask a question on social media, but just in case I miss it and I haven't gotten back to you, just ask it a second time because especially sites like Twitter or Facebook, stuff tends to scroll by pretty quick and I could miss it. Well, this week we are looking at Kickstarter regrets based on a question from Tabletop Bellhop patron Duran Barnett. Duran writes, Kickstarter regrets? Which Kickstarters do you wish you hadn't backed? Which Kickstarters do you wish you had backed, and why? Well, thanks for the question, also for supporting our show, Duran. See, the thing with Kickstarter is that no matter what, you t are taking a chance. If you give anyone money, a buck to a thousand dollars, you're still taking a chance. No matter how reputable the creator is, no matter how many previous projects they've created, no matter if the game is already finished or they're just trying to get started on it, there's actually no guarantees that you're going to get what you paid for. There's also no guarantee that if you do get what you paid for, it's gonna be worth what you paid for or be exactly what you expected. It may be that the game just isn't as good as you hoped, or the component quality isn't what you expected, or the game went on sale on Amazon for half the price you paid before your Kickstarter copy even showed up. Despite how it may be used by many people, Kickstarter is a funding, pro, uh, funding platform. It mm -hmm. is there to fund creative projects, just as the stock market funds companies. However, instead of stocks, stocks you receive rewards but just like the stock market, there is a risk associated with any participation on your part. While Kickstarter takes steps to minimize that risk, they cannot and will not completely eliminate it. Now, pretty much all the things I just mentioned have happened to me. Now, what I'm going to do tonight is I am going to talk about some of the worst. I've got a project that I spent good money on. Uh, quite a bit of good money on and got absolutely zero zilch nada for absolutely nothing completely wasted money I've got a project that while it showed up was not anywhere near what was promised on the Kickstarter And then lastly, I've got a project. I never would have gotten had I not fought for it Now I'm going to talk about each of these in more detail and then we're going to follow that up with some projects I wish I'd backed I tend to be a little bit more gun-shy on Kickstarter and tend to stick more with photography and computer-related projects. So we're going to be focusing, focusing specifically on Moe's regrets here tonight. And first yeah, up... Sean's smart enough not to back for <laughs> Kickstarters. And first up, a project that never delivered. Now, thankfully, I only have one of these. Of all the projects I backed on Kickstarter, uh, only one was a complete watch. So I guess my ratio is pretty good, my batting average, if you will. I tend to at least get what I paid for. Now that project was Labyrinths, 
customized modular dungeon terrain, uh, who was put out by Iron Ring Games. Now, this was a project for Dwarven Forge-style dungeon terrain. Uh, While not cheap, it was much more affordable than Dwarven Forge. And all the signs were that this was a solid, legit project. Now, while I did spend quite a many, uh, excuse me, while I did spend quite a bit of money on this project, I didn't go all in. Thankfully, I didn't go for the thousand dollar get multiple dungeons. I was fairly reasonable doing it uh, with mainly add-ons. Because in this particular project, when they launched, I actually got in contact with the the head creator and convinced them to create add-on style pledge levels. Because what I really wanted were accessories. I have Dwarven Forge. I didn't need dungeon walls. Plus, I actually found I don't really like using uh, Dwarven Forge because if you're sitting down at the table, you can't see through the walls and you, you find you have to stand up to play. What I really like to use when I'm running role-playing games is just 3D scenery. So I use flat tiles for the dungeon, but then I put 3D bookcases and shelves and barrels of ale and all that stuff on it. That's the stuff I dig. So I got a hold of them, and they had these things as part of their pledges, like you could get a hole in. Well, I didn't want the walls. All I wanted was the stuff from the inside. So after some back and forth, we worked out a deal where they had said back at this level. It was a fairly low level. And then add in so much money for each add-on you wanted. And I did that. Now, at this point, there was no sign that this project was going to head south. Like, even after the project ended, there was, I would say, significant communication. It, was, it wasn't it was too much. It wasn't too little. Um, I also had direct messages back and forth from Iron Ring. Like, they actually double confirmed my uh, address, and then they confirmed the shipping to Canada because shipping went up because they, they were delayed in a year. Too many people on Kickstarter do this. It becomes a new year. The shipping rates go up, and they didn't account for it. And I even perfectly agreed. I'm like, I get it. I understand. I will pay for the difference. And it looked good. Like, everything looked perfect. I thought we were all good at first. <clears throat> Even in hindsight, this one was not obviously bound to failure. Regular, clear communication from the project is normally a good sign of a team really determined to deliver. No, I agree. Uh, it, it looked great. Like, s- the problem was soon enough, like, uh, the, after the project was closed, things were, of course, running late. At this point, that's a given for pretty much every Kickstarter. It doesn't happen all the time. There are some awesome projects out there that deliver on time, but most are, do tend to run late. Uh, but then all of a sudden, we started getting the bad news updates, right? Uh, Iron Ring, you could tell, was was over their head. Uh, the Kickstarter was too successful. They had way too many orders. Way too many. Um, it was like, you know, either, I'm not sure if it was one guy or a small group of guys trying to make fill molds with dentist, you know, um, plaster and waiting for stuff to dry. And it, it was one of those cases where there's just, they couldn't keep up with the demand. And then trying to rush, they ended up damaging one of the molds. And it was one of the basic molds, like whatever, a floor or a wall. I don't, don't remember what, but it was a mold they didn't have a backup. And it was a mold needed to fulfill the basic core kit. And at that point, backers were getting upset. Things turned nasty in the updates. Uh, I got to admit, it wasn't long after that. Iron Ring declared bankruptcy. Shortly after that, they vanished. Like, literally vanished. Like, not just no more updates. Like, their website was gone. Email started to bounce. No one knows what happened to these people. They declared bankruptcy. I'm sure the lawyers probably told them to do it. But just gone. And sadly, this is one of the real problems with Kickstarter. Uh, If you had purchased stock in a company... There are legal avenues to attempt to re- recoup your investment uh, to jump in on the bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, when you back on Kickstarter, I'm not aware of any such method where you can get onto that creditors list in a bankruptcy proceeding. Uh, you're yeah. just out the money. Like technically, the Kickstarter, according to their terms of service, they do owe you a refund. But once they declare bankruptcy, that changes everything. Right. They're now insolvent, and they don't Plus, owe I mean, you Kick- anything. Kickstarter would have to go into bankruptcy court and try and make money back. But Kickstarter has already taken their cut, so they aren't yes. going to do that. They aren't going to do it. Very true. Now, for this particular project, I do know some people got their stuff. They were really focused on filling the core sets first, right? The people who bought the the big package deals with the dungeons and everything. And they weren't so worried about the add-ons. And, well, the problem for me was I only backed for add-ons. So my order never got touched. Now, I got to admit, in this case, I somewhat feel bad for Iron Ring. Like, you could tell they got in over their heads. The project was too successful. This is way back, like 2014. So this Kickstarter was new. People didn't know better. Nowadays, it's, it's... more frowned upon like you should know better you could say that back then 
I don't know if they should have known better. They th- This is before the Reaper Bones massive Kickstarters or some of the other stuff that really took off. Uh, despite feeling bad, though, I got to say, I'm out quite a bit of money for this one, so I'm not happy. Yeah, I, I think you're much too polite, really. Uh, I don't think there's any need to feel bad for Iron Ring. At worst, they had some stress and learned some lessons and walked away, hopefully not too much out of pocket. Uh, but there's actually a chance they could have walked away ahead of where they started, depending mm. on how they structured themselves going in. Um, projects have a choice when you're, when you're getting set up, right? You can gang, gamble just as much as the backers, or you can properly prepare yourself going in so that the backers are the ones who are absorbing basically all the risk. Yeah, very if true. If they choose wrong at the beginning, well, that's, that's on them. Now, I noticed Major Kayla mentioned that her biggest regret was Ancient Dice, which turned out to be a scam. I don't know that one. I, the dice sets Ancient Dice. I'm not sure which ones the Ancient Dice were. Uh, and Poncho72 has some Kingdom Death Monster Kickstarter regret. Oh, that one was a mess. Like, I, think, I think everyone heard about that one with the other companies having to swoop in and take over the project. And oh, that, that one was a disaster. I'm glad I, there, there's one I don't regret not backing. <laughs> Uh, Vorpal Wombats had a pretty good run of luck with Kickstarter with a, a couple of late but still communicated well. Uh, and Major Kayla regrets exploding kittens because uh, no one will play it anymore and she missed out on the original mass playing of it. Yeah, that, that was one I, I, I'm glad the, un, or what is the Oatmeal? Was that who did that? Yeah, the Oatmeal yeah. did well for that. Because I like the Oatmeal and I like his comics and the guy's got a great attitude. Not a game I was interested in, so yeah, no. not one of my regrets. And uh, and apparently Major Kayla misses, uh, wishes she'd caught Azul the first time uh, around. I didn't even realize it was a Kickstarter, but apparently there were special, no, I didn't tiles, know that either. special tiles available in the you know, original Kickstarter version. Oh, I, I'm assuming those are probably the Joker uh, the Joker tiles that they released separate later. Oh, possibly. I didn't know that was a Kickstarter either. Uh, Dice made out of petrified wood was that. Uh, oh, okay. That she's got. Yeah, scams. Scams are bad. So. Yeah. <laughs> Possibly. Uh, I thankfully have not hit any scams. All right. Next up, a project that didn't live up to its expectations. That would be this box right here. This is Torn Armor from Alyssa Faden. One of my biggest Kickstarter regrets overall. This beats out all of them. Um, The biggest reason is because I believed in this one. So much so that Alyssa got a hold of me and paid me to promote the the project. Like, full disclosure here. Alyssa Faden paid me to promote this game, Torn Armor. I took that to heart. I talked about this game everywhere on social media. I shared links. I shared pictures. I even rebooted my Cool Mini or Not account, like because Cool Mini or Not, before they were a big board game company, was a hot or not for miniatures, uh, just so I could talk about the game there. Like I did everything I could to help this project fund. And I even took the money they gave me and used that to back the project myself because I thought it was worth it. I actually believed in this project, which is why I was willing to promote it. Well, and this is part of the key to making Kickstarters work, actually. When we spoke with uh, Daniel Zayas back in episode 18, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a strong marketing ahead of and it, at those first few days of that Kickstarter project can make or break your project out of the gate. Yeah, I remember back then, KickTrack was still pretty new, and pretty much every project was a U. There was a huge spike when it launched, then everything petered out, and then there's a huge spike in the last 48 hours. Torn Armor literally started off real slow, but just slowly climbed the whole time, which I think part of that was the work myself. There were a couple other people hired to do the same, uh, did on promoting this game. Now, Torn Armor is supposed to be a hobby miniature battle game, like think Warhammer type game, but on a board. Uh, with some of, I got to still say, to this day, some of the fan, most fantastic looking miniatures I've ever seen designed. Uh, they had them all fully designed in 3D by a guy, Tom, I forget his last name, who had done 3D rendering of every miniature that was going to be in the game. And there were some really cool ones, but as the it got momentum, they, they unlocked more of them, right? Um Really liked the look of it. Uh, one side of it was very anthropomorphic fantasy races with, uh, I think they're called the Maicheans. And there were like monkey people and ferret people and so on. And they were fighting steampunk Romans. Now, I got a bit, I have no clue where that world comes from. It's it's an interesting mix. But I really dug the Roman-looking mecha, uh, steampunk-looking mechs. I guess they kind of look Iron Kingdoms-ish, but still, I don't know, I dug it. And then, you know, normal Roman Corsairs and stuff like that. And for me, this project, 
I honestly had nothing to do with the game. I didn't care what the game looked like, what the game was about. I wanted those minis. Uh, and that was the same for many other people. I know locals here in Windsor, uh, Steve Joannis and some other painters who got in on this project just to get these. Now, there were game play videos. I watched a couple of them. The game looked decent enough, but that was secondary. I wanted my uh, assault behemoths and my war golems. And plus, they even, as stretch goals, put out some 3D terrain, which, again, as I mentioned above, I love 3D scenery for my miniature games and for my RPG games. For me, it was never about the actual game. Certainly sounds amazing. Now, miniature games are notoriously pricey, so Kickstarter is certainly a smart path to take so that you don't have that burden of the extraordinary costs for molds on your credit card, you know, hoping for people to buy. Very true, very true. And the other thing, too, is miniatures nowadays are much more common. And I have to assume there's just more Chinese manufacturers who do minis now. Because you see cool mini or not, games come out now with 300 miniatures in them. That was not common back with Torn Armor, which again was like around 2013, 2014. I forget the exact year. It might have even been 2015, but it, still three, four years ago. It wasn't as common to see these big boxes full of miniatures. Now, the problem with all of this is, even though what everyone cared about the miniatures and everyone was so-so on the game, all we ever got was the game. 561 people backed this project. They raised $67,742. Again, this is... Five years ago Kickstarter, not modern Kickstarter. Only of those, 128 people got what they paid for. And those are the people who bought, backed for a PDF of the rulebook or for an art print. No one else got the full reward they backed at. No one received any miniatures. Uh, I got to say the, the updates are filled with tales of woe about what happened. Uh, there were issues with uh, sculptures. There were issues with the Chinese company hired to make the miniatures. Uh, Reaper miniatures got involved and tried to help out, but that fell through. Uh, there was a lot of buzz about this when it happened. Like you go on board Geek, Geek there's still a lot of talk about it. Uh, there's a lot of speculation out there about what happened and whose fault it all was. Now, I know Alyssa Faden as a map maker and a very mm -hmm. skilled one. Um, it sounds like this might really just be a case of overreach without fully understanding the entire process and mapping out your process in advance. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think there was any um, project management experience on the team. Uh, again, Kickstarter was still pretty new back then. Like it had been around for a few years, but for people putting out games on it, people, you, they were just going off other successful projects thinking that they could do the same thing. Uh, in this case, Reaper Bones was out at this point. And they're like, well, if we just do what Reaper Bones did, we'll be able to do the same thing. They made a million dollars, right? right. I, I really do think that that's true. It just the Plus, I don't think the knowledge was out there, right? There was no Daniel Zayas on Facebook saying, hey, pay me 50 bucks and I'll help consult your Kickstarter. It's just that job. Kickstarter consultant wasn't a thing back then. So obviously I have it. I have my copy of Torn Armor. So I got my reward. I have no right to uh, ask for a refund at this point. I didn't get all the stretch goals that were promised, but I did get what the initial uh, publishing, which was for a board game. I got the board game. Um... It's a box. It's got fold-out maps. It's got custom dice. It's got a rule book. And it's got uh, this. These. This is it. This is what you get. That's it. Yeah. Instead of miniatures. Not even a lot of them. Cardboard standees. Very tiny cardboard standees. So you can kind of see how cool the Roman-looking mech things were. Would have been awesome as minis. Um... To be honest, this is it. There was a lot more units. They never bothered to make standees for them. So I don't even have my behemoths in cardboard size. Because at that point, they were stretch goals. And they're like, oh, they're all going to be minis. They're all going to be minis. So they never even bothered getting art or standees for it. Uh, I got to admit, I've never played this. Obviously, it's not punched. Probably should be on the less shame, more game pile. But you know what? I never wanted the game. I just wanted the minis. Now, I got to say, from what I've seen online, uh, the game itself isn't really that good. I guess it's uh, almost a direct copy of Dust Tactics, which is uh, another miniature game, sci-fi. Uh, they basically just took the exact rules from that game and put a fantasy theme on it, which is also kind of crappy. Well, the one thing I discovered, uh, I ran across a Kickstarter where Impact Miniatures had purchased the rights to a variety of old failed Kickstarter projects whether they failed before or after funding or didn't fund. Uh, and uh, Torn Armor was one of them. Um, so there's apparently a late backer option still. 
And if you're if you're uh, still really interested, <laughs> uh, there's a ma- there's a uh, a link we've got where you can uh, try your luck there. Now the one thing I was seeing uh, when I was looking at these the uh, the renderings on the this Kickstarter page that uh, that Roman Mecca looks a whole lot like the aliens from Fifth Element. The robotic yeah. aliens from Fifth Element. I, I, a little I, bit. Because I, I saw that picture. I saw the picture on the website, and I went, "Oh, look! Someone made a mini of that." And then you pointing that out, what it was. I'm like, "Oh, that that's the one you were." Yeah. So. Yeah, I can see that a bit. So yeah, I, w- I was fascinated with this. Sean gave me the heads up before we had the show about the, this other Kickstarter. I gotta say, it's a it, impact actually. A uh, big thumbs up to them. They helped us out for Extra Life last year. They were one of our sponsors. Big fan of Impact. Uh, at first, I was thinking they were the company that. Got messed up in all this thing early on. I was wrong. That's a different company. Um, but Impact is, is, a, is a good company, delivers well. I've had some great personal interactions with them. And I think it's kind of cool that they did this, right? Like they went around and found all these lost patterns for minis. I'm assuming licensed them off the original owners, probably at a pretty good price, and are now producing them. The thing is, though, their prices are a little nuts. So to get what I would have wanted from Torn Armor, I would have to back at the $900 level to get just the two assault behemoths that were only $40 on the original Kickstarter. Now, I got to admit, Alyssa did probably undersell her stuff, but not by that much. So good on Impact if this is working for them. uh, It did succeed. It funded. So they did find enough people interested. But at that price, I think I'll pass and stick to just my box. I've spent enough money on Torn Armor. And next up, a project that you had to fight for. All right, that one is this, Mobile mobile Frame Zero, or MF Zero. This is a rather cool-sounding miniature battle game that uses mecha built out of building blocks, like Lego, right? doesn't have to be Lego. Uh, It uses a dice pool-based system where different systems on your mecha are represented by different colored dice. So, like, movement, I don't remember the numbers off my head, could be blue, and you could get movement at second level would be from a blue D6 to a blue D8. And weapons are, say, red dice, and you start off with, uh, like, basic red dice, and melee might use a D8 instead of a D6 or so on. But one of the really neat things is by using plastic building blocks, they're able to actually have rules for things like mechs getting damaged and, like, losing an arm or losing a leg, and you actually take it off the Lego bit. And the other one is the terrain you build and the game is destructible. So when you miss a mech, you could hit the train behind it and remove some bricks from it. I gotta say, the game sounded really cool. Plus, obviously, here it is. I got it. Here it is. I've had it for a long time. I was a little late, but nothing unreasonable. The thing is, I didn't back it for this. Now, this isn't one where I was waiting for miniatures, but in one of the many updates, they offered uh, what's a stretch goal. They offered a stretch goal. The thing is, this is the oldest Kickstarter I ever backed. It's the second one I ever backed in 2012. Back then, we didn't know the term stretch goal. This isn't a thing that existed. People hadn't figured that out yet. So what this was, was them going, hey, if we get to X money, we're not going to only put this out. We're going to release a role-playing game set in this setting. And I'm like, damn, that seems pretty cool. Because, like, well, Lego Mecha game's neat, but an RPG? And back in 2012, I was much more into RPGs than I am now. I still dig RPGs, but I play way more board games than role-playing games. Back then, I was more heavily into role-playing games. So I'm like, hey, Lego Mecha sounds cool. The rules look good, but, man, an RPG set in that setting, that sounds fantastic. And that's when I gave them my money. I keep picturing the Lego robotics sets my son plays with <laughs> at school where you can actually, like, program robots. Mm-hmm. And that would just really take this to the next level if you had the time and money to, to put into that. Very uh, true. Those <laughs> Lego robot sets are not cheap, though. Oh, no. It's, uh, they're, they're, they're like $500 per set, yeah. uh, which that's, is why, they, which is why they do it as an after-school thing at the, at the schools because they just bring... Uh, they, they One night a week, they, they, each school gets it sort of thing, and they, they travel it around for the whole school board. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, it's one I, I would love to have the money to give that to our kids, but that's not <laughs> something we've been able to afford. No, I was I was happy to let him uh, enjoy it at school. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So, like I said, I well, it was re- late. I got it. I read it. It's it's exactly what was promised. It's it's a nice book, slightly odd formatting, full color, glossy. It's nice. It's good. Um, and then I, I months went by. And more than months, years, basically, I, I just forgot about it, right? I, I got this. I completely forgot about the RPG portion of it. 
And then years later, I was having a conversation with someone. It was on Google+. Plus. I remember that. And they wanted to know about all my unfulfilled Kickstarter rewards. And I went through my Kickstarter list because if you're on Kickstarter, you can check off what you've got and what you haven't. And here I scroll to the very bottom and there's mobile frame zero and there's no check mark. And I'm like, wait, I got that. Why didn't I check mark that? And I clicked on it. And there's a note from, uh, from I'm forgetting the person who was running this one. But anyway, uh, a note Joshua. from Joshua Newman. A note from him. And I'm like, wait a minute. I never got the RPG part. Wow. Now, at this point, it was four years later. I got to admit, like, I had completely forgotten about it. To be fair, most people would write it off as a lost cause after four years. But true enough, but I figure why not, right? Like, so I logged into Kickstarter and I sent Joshua a message saying, hey, where's our RPG? And th this is where it turns south, right? Like, I was pretty happy with this project up till this point, but the reply I got was disappointing. Basically, I was told, this is in quotes, there was surprisingly little interest in the RPG. And then they felt like, quotes again, no one cares about it, cared about it. So no one cared about it. So Joshua just never got around to writing it because no one wanted it. So why bother? Now, in the meantime, and this is kind of funky, um, I'm sure it's just everyone in the industry is all friends, but another indie RPG designer, Vincent Baker, went and wrote his own role-playing game based on Mobile Frame Zero. And that role-playing game is called Firebrands. So it ended up that they never planned on writing the RPG, even though it was promised. It was a stretch goal. It was there in the text saying, hey, if we get this much money, we're going to write an RPG. And the only reason I gave the money was because of this promised RPG. I, I was told then, after pointing this out, that I'm the only one to ever have complained about this. I'm like, well, what the heck? Like, still, it's it's there. It's in writing. Like, what uh, is that it? And I think I quite I questioned Joshua, right? Like, is that it? So then, to make it right, Joshua offered to send me a copy of Vincent's game, which isn't quite what I signed up for, but I guess it's something. Then again, nothing happened. Like for a year and a half, I I got updates. I got told, oh wait, we tried to get you Firebrands, but it's out of print. And then I got, oh, Vincent's going to have copies at Origins. I'm going to Origins. I'll get it off him. Oh, sorry, I didn't go to the con, but I'll get you a copy soon. And that went on for a year and a half. Now, this is what's really disappointing to me. It's one thing to fail at something, and it's one thing to say, sorry, you know, this didn't go anywhere. Sorry. But yeah. to lead people on and just sort of, oh, I'm going to do this. Well, I'm going to do this. No, don't worry. Oh, we'll get you. We'll get there. No, no. Just either say you can do it or don't. Don't yeah. don't drag it out. And I'm sure he was probably cursing my name, right? He was probably on Twitter going, oh, that one flipping backer who wants a stupid RPG that we never even said we were going to make, right? I don't know. Now, I got to say, I've got it. It's right here. Here's my copy of Firebrands. Uh, he even got it signed by Vincent Baker. I guess that makes it better. I don't know. So I did get it. I got my Mobile Frame Zero RPG. Uh, did show up five years late after the project had ended. And if I hadn't said anything, I wouldn't have this here right now. It wouldn't exist. So I guess it just goes to show you that persistence really can pay off. But the fact that you had to go to such lengths does not speak well of those involved in the project. Yeah, I got it. They're, they're, they put out another Kickstarter that even looked even cooler, I got to admit, that was spaceships, starships built with Lego. And I kind of wanted to back it, but there was no way I was going to give them any more mo money after this. No, understandable. And uh, projects you wish you had backed. All right. Uh, here's here's uh, the stuff I, I regret not backing. Uh, there are many of these, I got to say. Like, really, to, to, for one, I'm not, I'm not a big one to, to dwell on what could have been. But also, I found that most Kickstarters, I'm really happy to just wait for the game to come out in retail. Uh most of the time, you can get them cheaper than backers paid. Now, I realize the backers are making something a reality, and, and there is some pride in that. But you know what? But money's tight. Um, there's a reason I run the Tabletop Deals account, right? There's a reason I'm looking for cheap prices. And way too often, you can find the games cheaper in retail or online and often get them before backers do, which that's got to frustrate backers. But that's one of the reasons I don't back. And plus, uh, there's very few Kickstarter exclusives that make me feel like I'm actually missing out. Like, oh, yay, you got uh, whatever, a T-shirt. Well, who cares? You happen to get it, some cards with different art. Nah, it's fine. I'll just wait and get it once it's out. Now, there are a uh, few. I'm going to talk about three that I do somewhat regret not backing. 
Yeah. It's hard with these games as you're not only taking a risk, but you're taking on the burden of those extra costs that the retail purchasers won't have to accept. In most cases, those initial startup costs are what can bury a project. Mm -hmm. Once you have all your molds and art and layouts set, well, manufacturing additional copies, that's just cheap and easy. I mean, that's just sort of photocopy <laughs> in, a, yeah, in a greater in a sense. Um, so, the, you know, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's hard, but you have to, so you have to love it and you have to go in knowing that really. Yeah, it's a, if I get people, if you have the spare money and you, you want to take pride and be part of making something, that's awesome. Some of the best projects are also going to take your input, right? You become almost part of the development team by backing them. I get doing it for that reason, too. But overall, in most cases, there's enough games out there. I can just wait for it to come out. Now, one of the ones I do regret, um, I would have brought my box up here because uh, I bought the retail copy. That's Conan by Monolith Games. Now, I own the retail version. I picked it up. It looks fantastic. The only reason I didn't bring it up here is it is currently holding up two piles of chain. And I can't, uh, you know, Conan's holding up two piles of chain. I just can't break that relationship yet. That's going to be the last game I play. Uh, well, I got the game. The initial rulebook has some serious issues, enough that Asmodee has put out an updated set of books that you can order online and get shipped to you for free. Uh, even in Canada. Actually, I did an unboxing of those at the end of one of the shows uh, when I got my copies. Now, well, my copy of the game looks great. Um, and, and I now have the better rules, and it looks awesome. It looks neat. I really like the way the DM plays. It's the fact that it looks good that is what bums me out, because had I backed the Kickstarter, I would have gotten, it's like 2.8 times the number of miniatures. Like, it's a crazy number. Like, I got 90-some, and I would have got 300 or something. Like, it's insane. Uh, the Overlord dashboard would have been made of plastic. Uh, I would have gotten more than, um, I think it's four more scenarios. Uh, and mo lots of other dice, custom dice, uh, so plastic scenery, five more characters, more maps. Like, like I'm, I don't even, I'm not even going to list it off. There's tons. Like, it is a lot of stuff. And looking at the pledge manager, it was literally only forty dollars more than the cost of the base game. And this is a hundred dollar game, so forty bucks isn't like you're not even doubling the price of the game. If only forty dollars more, I would have gotten almost three times the content. Yeah, and that is a, a bitter pill to swallow. I, I, you know, at the time of a Kickstarter project, in many cases you're not going to be able to tell what will and won't be in a retail box. Now, I think things are have changed a little bit and are better now. But uh, yeah, no, it's uh, that's a tough one. Especially when you know, to not to know or not know, you're losing, going to be losing out on that mm. much stuff. Yeah, it, it's rough. Like I said, that's one. Like I, I'm even tempted to go on eBay and buy a Kickstarter copy because there's so much, and it's still like almost reasonable prices because you get so much stuff in those boxes. So another one I now kind of wish I backed is Vinhos Deluxe. Um, I'm a big fan of heavy games, uh, and Vinhos is there. It's it's an up there in weight. It's a it's excuse me. It's up there with the food chain magnets of the world, stuff like that. Now you can get Vinhos Deluxe in stores, but the stretch goals they unlocked were really impressive. Uh, it's a real mix of upgraded components and additional go game content, and it's all stuff you can't get in retail. Now, they have said some, if not all of it, will be released as expansions. And I started trying to dig it out and figure it out. And there are two or three small expansions out, but not all of it has come out as expansions. You're basically, at this point, if you didn't back the Kickstarter, you're left out. Yeah, they put out four expansions in 2016, specifically for the Deluxe Edition. Yeah. So, that, you know, there's a, a good bit out there. But, uh, yeah, that uh, that game, I mean, what a crazy high rating and crazy oh, yeah. high uh weight, weight. that's yeah. um no it, it looks perfect yeah. like it, it's one i'm i'm i i should just pick up the retail version but I, i'm like oh i should have got the kickstarter i keep hoping they'll do a second printing and then maybe i'll jump in on it right well i guess a lot of it comes down to how much you're willing or able to spend when that project is live sometimes you end up missing out simply because you can't afford to back at a particular mm -hmm. time and that's probably when it hurts the most uh, knowing that you'll never be able to get that additional stuff, not because you missed out because you forgot or because you didn't trust them, but because, well, you just didn't have the money right then. And, and it's, yeah. it's tough. It's tough right now, especially when, you know, if this game comes out three weeks after you, you know, you spend your Kickstarter budget on that other game yeah. that looked good, but, oh, it didn't look as good as this game, which you didn't even know about until it and showed up. So. See that definitely true. I, I see that a lot right now, I guess, for RPGs. 
Uh, again, I, I'm now more of a board gamer than a role-playing game gamer. I still dig RPGs, but I haven't been able to get a, a steady group together for about a year and a half now. So that limits it. I can run some one-shots. I'm, I'm really looking forward to Queen City Conquest and Game to Play. So I'm still into that hobby, but like, it's not. I'm not going to back any Kickstarters. I've got plenty of RPGs downstairs uh, that I'm trying to read through RPG a month just to get some use out of because I'm not playing. But the big thing was Kickstarter launched a thing this month where they were promoting RPG zines. And Kickstarter promoted this. So if you go on the Kickstarter homepage, there's tons of them. So that just means there's like a fantastic number of great RPG zines coming out from all these indie publishers. But it's like a new one launches every day. And people I know that have significant money and financial backing are crying because they're like, I want to back them all. Right? Like you've got people... Uh, I won't name names. You've got people who normally would support all of these independent publishers and just be right all about it that are like, I can't. Like, someone pointed out there was something like 52 that, RPG zines that launched in February. Like, it's just you can't keep up. So it's not even just the amount of money you have, but the amount of projects, right? Like, the, the money's getting spread thin because of that. What was it, 8,500 projects, including expansions yeah. and things <laughs> last year? That was insane. That's, that's still insane. Yeah. So overall, for my biggest regret when it comes to stuff I didn't back and wish I had is a game called Seventh Continent. I have yet to hear anything bad about this game. Everything I see is positive, except for people complaining you can't get it in retail. Um, I've yet to see a negative review. It shows up over and over again on top cooperative game lists. And I got to say, I feel like I'm missing out by not owning this game. There are so many people that recommend this game for so many different settings, for so many different player counts, best solo game, best played with groups, best to play with your family. The problem is this game was 100% Kickstarter exclusive. They will not sell it in stores. You'll never find it at a local game store. It's never going to be in distribution. Yes, you can find it now and then on Amazon from a third-party seller, but that's someone who bought it on Kickstarter, who's now selling their copy. Uh, eBay, same thing. You'll find copies, but this is all stupid prices on the secondary market. To actually get a copy of the game, the only way I'm probably ever going to get a copy is if they do a reprinting. Now, this is a really neat game that's a card-driven, exploring an island that's got some great mechanics that are based on uh, the Robinson Crusoe game, which we talked about a few episodes back, where it's like, oh, you found uh, a poisonous spider, do you kill it or chase it away? And it ends up that if you chased it away, it comes back and bites you during the night, but if you killed it, you actually get poisoned or something, right? Like, And, it, and there's ways in the game where things evolve and supposedly, based on people who finished it, the story's fantastic and there's like hundred and some hours worth of gameplay in the box, right? Like it just sounds amazing, and I, I'm, I missed out. There's, it's done. The Kickstarter's done, and I'm not willing to pay three to four hundred dollars on it, the secondary market for it. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm of two minds about Kickstarter exclusives, and I, I see with Seven Continent they have twelve expansions available for that too. Like they again, just... I, that's I don't think you buy them separate. Yeah, it's no, exactly. Those are stretch goals, right? When you yeah. back. Oh, the Kickstarter. is that what it is? Ah, I see. Yeah, you back the Kickstarter, you go all in, and you get all the expansion content too. Right. So, you know, as an artist, I understand Kickstarter uh, exclusives. Um, it makes a lot of sense if you're a photographer, a painter, uh, you know, there's a lot of things where it does make sense. Uh, but when it comes to retail product, you know, something that you are going to essentially, once you've designed it, once it's done, you can, in a grand sense, photocopy your, your content, you know, you can make, once you've got a mold, you can make more minis. You can, you know, once you've got your layout, you can print more, bo uh, more boards whatever you need. Uh, I'm just not, 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 not into that. That's just, that's me though. I, I understand why people do it, but. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a business decision, right? Uh, it, this way they never have to worry about dealing with distributors. They never have to worry about game stores yep. and they keep selling out. Like, like they got enough backers, right? Yep, and then yep. no, it's... They, they don't have to worry about inventory or warehousing. It's done. Everyone who wanted one got their copy. I'm sure they printed some extras, but it's not like having to have stock on hand. And all of a sudden, when the new hotness comes out, Eighth Continent, they don't have all these extra copies sitting on game store shelves, right? Like, yep. I kind of get it. Like, I personally, I don't know, you think you'd want your game in all the retail stores, and you'd want local game stores doing demos, and you'd want all that to happen. But then, if you can just launch a new Kickstarter every two years for a new printing... Yep. Like that's how Gloomhaven did it, right? The first printing, but then there was enough feedback to get into stores that finally happened. But at first, it was a Kickstarter exclusive. Yep. Uh, so we've got uh, uh, Philosopher 
Uh, just yep. went on Kickstarter and searched Zine Quest for RPG zines and got 108 there, see, results. I said I, I said roughly 50. I, there, I was I was at, I was yeah. at 50. percent I was way off. Like I said it's supposed to be awesome. Yep. So, uh, and then uh, Vorpal Wombat's mentioning that he's been backing things uh, at mostly at a PDF only level to limit his yep. risk. And also because uh, he's concerned about moving before anything shift ships, and that's a yes. real concern. You know, if you do have plans to relocate, almost you have to think two years ahead in some of the cases. Um, yeah. You know, you're going to run into problems if uh, you're in the middle of moving, and all of a sudden they uh, they they start sending out shipping announcements. You could, uh, or or you know, you're going to be moving in a few months, and they start sending out shipping announcements. Yeah. It, it gets uh, it gets tough. Um, and uh, Vorpal Wombat was, uh, I guess, jumped in on the second edition of MF Zero, uh, and it never heard, hadn't heard any of the stories about that original. Yeah, the, if you go through, like, obviously, no one noticed it, but there was an update, and there were people who were excited about the RPG at the time. Yeah, I don't know, kind of weird. I, I, same thing. I complained about it online, and people were like, "What RPG?" And I'm like, <laughs> ah, "That's what it said." And I, I actually had like screenshot it, shared it on Facebook. So people are like, "What are you talking about?" I'm like, "I, I guess I really was the only one who cared." And uh, Shazar points out that just on March 12th, uh, Asmodee will be uh, distributing for Simon in North America. But mm. we noticed, uh, reading through the fine print, it will not be for their Kickstarters. But after the Kickstarter is done, as soon as it's done, any additional product will be through Asmodee. Yeah, so. that's... I don't know. That's Asmodee's yeah. becoming a monopoly. Yeah, I'm just glad because Asmodee got bought last year, and I expected a big change, and it didn't seem to come. It still seems like business as usual, so that's a good thing. Right. Uh, and Angie Games is claiming that you have hallucinated an entire RPG. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, it's right here. There it is. <laughs> the one that confused me is I thought he sent me five copies. So here's the cool thing. You put out the game. They're like, it's a kind of game where all the players need a copy of the book, so we just packaged it together so you get a copy for your whole group. I'm like, that's cool. Like... There's stuff I like about it. I just yep. shouldn't have had to fight so hard to get it. Uh, and Midge Kayla, which, which second release is that you were talking about? Sorry, I missed uh, missed when that came out on the uh, chat. But you're also mentioning that you like that one seven C through the uh, drive through RPG, so that way you can print it when you want it. Yes. And yeah. If you just save up a bunch of stuff when you're ready to go in a reading binge, you can print it out. Seventh. Yeah, continent. Seventh Continent. They, like I said they did do two Kickstarters so far, so they'll well, probably do a third. Twice. And then I. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I missed it twice. Well, the first time I didn't care. Like, right. I, I didn't feel I missed out because there wasn't a buzz, right? And that's when the first one came out. Everyone's like, oh, my God. Well, that's what happened with me at Gloomhaven, right? Yeah. But when I went Gloomhaven, I got right in on the second printing. I'm like, I am backing the second printing. Now, at that point, I didn't realize it was going to drop to under 100 bucks online. I might have been able to wait a bit. But, eh, I'm happy. We've gotten enough play out of that game now. I feel justified in the money I spent on it. But this, I spent more on Torn Armor, and I've never played that. So, yep. well... That's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see this and other topics answered in blog form. Uh, if you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or just email us, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. And now, a word from our sponsor. Last week, I talked about how I'm a fan of Quiver Time. Both the people I've interacted with online, mainly through Twitter, uh, also through email, and of their products. So both the people and the products. This week, though, I wanted to spend a moment talking about their premier product, the, the big thing that they push. That is the Quiver Playing Cards case, your premium way of carrying your cards. So each case is made out of PU leather. That's artificial leather for you druids out there. Uh, and it holds a crazy number of cards. 1,350 unsleeved cards, or 770 sleeved cards, or 625 double-sleeved cards, <laughs> or eight Ultra Pro deck boxes, six Pro deck boxes, or seven Legion card boxes, plus 30 sleeved cards, or three Satin Tower boxes, plus 70 sleeved cards. I... Uh, they card player, so I don't know about all the different boxes. I know this is one type, but I think it's cool that you can fit these boxes right in your quiver. Now, along with the case uh, and its double zippers, two straps, five Velcro dividers, you also get 100 transparent sleeves and four acrylic separators. Each quiver also comes with a three-year warranty. Now, 
We've got a special offer just for you, our listeners and viewers. For the entire month of March, head to Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, or the QuiverTime website, which is at QuiverTime.com slash bellhop, and use the code DINGDING ding for 10% off the entire line of QuiverTime products. So actually, Amazon.com, you got to use DING DING DING, three dings, because the U.S. is special, needs extra dings. They must have more dings down south. So again, ding ding at quivertime.com forward slash bellhop, ding ding at amazon.ca, or ding 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 at amazon.com. Now that covers the quiver card carrying case, extra sleeves, the Apollo sleeves, the dividers, and everything else Quivertime makes. We are growing through the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. <laughs> Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and everything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletop.com web page and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar for those of you here live just a heads up we will not be broadcasting a gloomhaven stream this coming friday the 15th as all three of us will be at breakout con in toronto we'll be back to our regular schedule the week after on the 22nd now speaking of gloomhaven it's time for our weekly gloomhaven update we had the whole team back together again finally Finally, get to go back to the actual campaign. While I said the random dungeons are cool and fun, and while it was cool discussing the FAQ, I, I'm getting a little sick of random dungeons. And man, actually, I'm getting a little annoyed by the FAQ too. But it's nice to just play the game. Now, I got to say, we did have a bit of a rough start because I tried to set up everything before everyone showed up, and I didn't have the party sheet. I think it's in Cat's box. Uh, I knew we were going to find an enchanter. Like, I knew that. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is the, the time we find the enchanter. And I knew it was an early mission, like 12, 13, 14. It was in the teens, right? So I start flipping through the scenario book, and I see 13, Temple of the Seer. And I'm like, oh, there we go. We're going to see the enchanter. It's got to be the seer. And I set up Temple of the Seer. Well, thankfully, this time we caught it right away. Uh, it ends up the mission is actually 14 called the Frozen Hollow, which I never would have got just flipping through the book. So I had to do a bit of swapping out of the monsters and tiles I had gotten ready already. Not the best way to start the stream, but at least we hadn't already picked cards and started taking turns like we had the last time I messed up the scenario. It was a bit quiet in the chat room this week, but we had some solid viewers who managed to stick with it even through the rougher start. Yeah. There was one other change that week, too. Uh, the one thing we did different is we started right at the dungeon. Uh, now, this was based on the fact we found out we've been playing wrong by visiting town after our random dungeons. You can't do that. That's against the rules, as we learned from the FAQ. This is the FAQ Sean and I talked about last week on our show on Friday. If you'd like to hear our take on the FAQ, head over to YouTube.com slash Tabletop Bellhop and check out our Gloomhaven series. So Frozen Hollow, uh, it went really well, felt really good. Uh, we decided to actually try it at normal level. This is the first time we have done a campaign game at normal level since like level one or two, way back, like first, second scenario we ever tried to do. Actually, I think it was um, the Windswept Highlands was the last time we tried to play at normal difficulty level. Now at this point, I gotta say, it didn't seem like we needed to keep playing uneasy. Uh, for one, we're all just getting better at the game. We're getting better at playing our characters and interacting and knowing what each other can do. Uh, plus, something I mentioned last week when we were doing the week, or sorry, the week review, the the Gloomhaven review, is that I've noticed that it seems like our characters are leveling up a little quicker than the monsters. Like uh, it's scaling in a way that we are feel more powerful. So we went in confident and decided to play right at level three. That was level three for us at this point, and we managed to pull it off. I would almost say it was easy, except for that last room. Now, the problem is that when we hit the last room, we found out that we were playing the extreme version. Uh, we say that word on the show too often. I think, Sean, I think we need an extreme graphic <laughs> that like flashes on the screen. That you can, I don't know, maybe you can even pull it up live stream. Uh, but this time, where I feel bad is it was in our favor. 
For those new listeners, this is actually a dramatic change, as normally yeah. the Gloomhaven Extreme Play is solidly against your fair adventurer's favor. Yeah, so maybe this is karma. Maybe that maybe that's all it was, right? For all the times we we messed up the rules and screwed ourselves over, this was the chance that we finally gave us a sort of advantage. Uh, I gotta say, it's it was probably a huge advantage. There is a chance it wouldn't have affected the game at all because it's something that's random. But there was a campaign effect, uh, a scenario effect. Sorry, a scenario effect that wasn't listed in the scenario book until the very end of the scenario. And it started with a number one. It had a one with a symbol on it. And I just expected that to be the room description because that's the way you set up the scenario. And when you open the right door, you read the next paragraph and you try not to read ahead. Well, this scenario didn't have any rooms. Like there was nothing to read when you opened any of the doors. So when I saw this last paragraph, I thought it was for when you open the last door. It ends up that no, there was no flavor text. This was something that should have happened right from the beginning. And out of every scenario we played over 15 games now, we might even be up to 20 games. I'm not sure the number we're at. This is the first time this has happened. Every other scenario has had a box to read when you open the door. So I saw it there, I assumed it was the stuff for the room, and skipped it, and went, no, I'm not going to touch that. And then when we got to room three, I went to read it, and was like, oh, shoot. Now, one thing I've been finding as a trend in this game's design is some questionable choices with how text is used. Mm -hmm. I get pretty disgusted with the card text during our FAQ exploration, and this seems, in a way, a bit more of the same. Uh, things just put in questionable places with questionable choices on whether uh, a font or a position or a line break is what actually says anything without any key or, or set way of doing things. Mm. Uh, if you're going to have an effect, something that affects an entire dungeon, put it up front. Line yeah. one, you hit the reader over the head with it, don't bury your lead. Oh, I, I can't argue with that at all. Like... Like, like the whole thing, for those of you just getting into the game, this is something to watch for, right? Uh, not every scenario, obviously, has sections to read when you open the doors. Some of you give you the whole info up front. Like, the, the whole problem is that we've been fighting with this, and I've mentioned it a few times, probably since the first time I talked about Gloomhaven. One of the things we've been fighting with is how much knowledge is open, right? Like, you've got the scenario book, all the info's there. Do you read the entire scenario decision? Like, does someone, does, like, do I, because I own the game, get to play Game Master and I know some stuff the rest of the group doesn't have? Or should I read the whole thing out loud so that the whole party has the same information? Do you read that after the door text? Like, no, you're not supposed to read it till you open the door, but you're going to notice some of it. So it's it's all the fight to keep things hidden, right? To To not spoil the game. Like, I almost wonder if we should switch to just playing with open information. Uh, there are rules for doing so. You can do it. You just up the monster level by one. So switch everything to level four monsters and just screw it. Let's play open rules. We're, here's the scenario book. If anyone wants to see it, I'll pass it to them. Maybe that's it. But I've been trying to play the other way. I've been trying to keep as much surprise as possible, and I'm trying to read as little as possible. So as soon as I got to that part of the paragraph, I'm like, oh, oh, wait. I don't read that till I open the door. No, I was supposed to read it. So... It's it's frustrating to fight with that. Like I'm I'm almost at the point we've talked about before. Supposedly there's an app out there that slowly reveals you the rooms. I'm I'm getting to the point. Maybe I should grab that, and then maybe I won't have that problem anymore. But the fact that I'm considering having to get a third party app is not a good sign for the game. Now I do have another final warning. This one's all over the internet. If you look up scenario fourteen, this specific scenario has four different scenario numbers listed just after you finish talking to Hale. Uh, these aren't unlocks. Now, the book is very clear about what's an unlock. They put a box and it says unlocks and it tells you what unlocks. But people see these scenarios and some of them you may not have unlocked yet and you see them and think, oh, I have to put those stickers on the board. No, 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 don't do that. It is just pointing out that those four areas are affected by the global achievement you've just unlocked. It's not something that actually unlocks because you did scenario 14. Now, we didn't make this mistake because I saw it all over the web. Hey, heads up. Hey, heads up. And plus, when we talked previously about having to go back in the book to figure out what to do next, I saw this come up because someone had put one of the stickers on they hadn't unlocked, and it didn't make sense because they went and tried to do that. But the problem is they use the same font. They use the same, here's a number in a circle, which everywhere else in the book means number in a circle means I put a sticker on the board. No, not in this case because it's not in the box that says unlock. 
Design and layout. So important. Yeah. Maybe in the fourth printing, they fix some of this. I don't know. I don't know what Isaac has done. Uh, it, it's rough. There, there's definitely issues. Like, uh, we could probably talk about, the, as Sean mentioned, the text on the cards. Like, I tried to explain it when we were playing, actually. That's something else you can see in the stream, is me trying to explain yeah. the, the bold and the small and the line breaks, and, and the players are just like, nah, I don't know. No, <laughs> I'm just going to use my cards as we have It doesn't make before. any sense. I, it's, it's arbitrary. Yeah. Anyway, enough of that. I don't want to get into that again. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll rant so, for a while. So, now, to get back to it, I, again, I, I didn't really spoil anything here. Um... Once we're done this scenario, now we go back to Gloomhaven, right? Uh, that's the thing. We finished a campaign scenario. Now we go back to Gloomhaven. You don't get to do that in Random Dungeon. But we didn't do it because what we're going to do is we're going to save that part for the next stream. So for those of you who actually watch the live stream or watch the YouTube videos, we're going to try to set it up so that every stream starts with us in Gloomhaven. And we'll put the map out, and that way I'll know ahead of time which scenario we're playing, so I won't set up the wrong scenario for one. Um, we'll do our town events. We'll probably get blessed because we like to do that. And now we have a certain global achievement unlocked. We may even get to see some enchanting. So that's something to look forward to during our next game, which will, again, will not be next Friday for those of you here live. Live. For those of you hearing on the podcast, it'll be the Friday after. Sorry, listening on the podcast. Skip in a week because we'll be at breakout. Remember that you can watch the Bellhop, Deanna, and Kator, pending any wedding plans, cons, or illnesses, every week at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, every Friday night at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. But not the 15th. That's the con excuse. Right. <laughs> And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletop. Table. Yeah, you think I'd know that by now. <laughs> yeah, that one? That, that one. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com under On the Table. Uh, this week, I've got two games of Moo. I visit the Ninth World. I draft some dice in Sagrada and return to the villages of Valeria. I still want to go on the Moo every time you say that. I guess I want to go mudding. Um, still exists. Last time I looked, oh, like Moos sure. still exist. While I played a lot of board game arena and only two deck builder games. Oh, it's a slow week for the deck builders. Yeah. So up first is Moo, which is, for many of you already know what I'm talking about, Sean's thinking of a multi-user dungeon, object-oriented shared reality. What I am talking about is Masters of Orion. Not the computer game, but rather the board game. Now, for some reason, this game like flew under everyone's radar. I have a feeling, mentioning this right now, there is someone listening to their podcatcher who's like, what, there's a Masters of Orion board game? I'm actually kind of surprised I haven't seen anyone see it in chat yet. Maybe I'm just waiting because there's lag and it's about to show up. Because every time I talk about this game, I have people go, whoa, wait, wait, there's a Master of Orion board game? Seriously? Oh my god, I have to get it. Now, unlike the Masters of the Universe review, I'm not warning you away from this one. Though, a lot of the reason this game flew under the radar is because the board game has not been well received, unfortunately. Now, I played the game, and I get it, because like many geeks, I loved the PC game Masters of Ryan. Even better was Masters of Ryan 2. I probably, ah, Civilization 2 or 3 probably beats it out, but it's probably the second most played game in, that I've ever played on a video game system, or on a computer, sorry, I didn't have it on a video game, not on a console. Like, I played hours and hours of Master of Ryan 2. Uh, to me, it's up there with the best PC games of all time, like stuff like Civ and XCOM. Uh, it's a huge 4X sci-fi game. Start with a planet, start building resources of a planet, start building fleets, expand out, try to take over the galaxy style of game. Now, the board game tries to recreate that as a quick filler card game. Like, massive, huge, spend hours playing it video game to half hour to an hour filler game. That's where the problem comes in. Like, Moo, you played for hours. It's it's epic. You grew your civilization out. You took over the galaxy. And trying to do all that and get that feel in half an hour to an hour, it just doesn't feel right. Like, it just doesn't feel like Moo. 
I, I gotta say, a really good move board game to me needs to be like an epic affair, like a Twilight Imperium. And that is not at all what this board game is. Well, sometimes it's important to match your game with its history. Uh, it seems like something like Zaya would be a better match for continuing on the tradition of something like Master of Orion than a card game tableau builder really is. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Zaya or Eclipse or Exodus, Proxima, Satari, any of the big 4X games, right? Like Twilight Imperial has got to be the closest, right? Like a game that literally can take you 12 hours to play, that's going to recreate that feel of Masters of Orion, where again, you start off from one planet and expand out. Now, all that said, this is a really good quick sci-fi board game. Like it reminds me of uh, Race for the Galaxy or Core Worlds. If you totally ignore the fact the box says Masters of Orion, Orion on the box, I really like this game. Now, I've only played twice, so I'll probably do a full review at some point, but I will summarize it here. Uh, it's a tableau bit with their game, as Sean mentioned, that uses action selection. So again, very similar to Race for the Galaxy. Uh, players get a number of actions based on how productive their planets are. Uh, these actions include propaganda to raise your morale, research, which gets you more cards, attacking, which is actually very well done because it only gives you victory points. It gives you victory points, but only costs the opponent morale, so there's not a huge disadvantage to getting attacked. Uh, building, which is putting new cards out. Exploiting, which gets into your 4X, which is you spend cards from your hand to get resources. And trading, which is just swapping one resource from the other. Now, there's only three resources in the game, so it's not big, heavy, or complex. You've got food, fleets, which represents your military strength and resources. Uh, it sounds weird that one of your resources is resources, but it represents all your generic tools and metals and everything. Now, each player's tableau is built up of four rows of cards, and each row can have five cards in it. These represent four different systems you control and then what you built in those systems. Now, the neat bit is you're laying the cards on top of each other, so only the card that shows can be used. So there's some really neat decisions on what order to play your cards in and whether to start a new system or build on one you have. Now, I really dig combat. Unlike most of these 4X games, combat's no big deal. Uh, if you have more fleets than someone else, you can attack them. You spend two fleet, you get two victory points, they lose one morale. While it rewards the attacker, it's not that punishing to the target. So there's really not a lot of bad feelings for the PvP aspect. I am really enjoying this game. Like, there's, there's obviously more to it than this short summary, but I recommend it. Like, pick it up. Just don't expect it to feel like Moo 2. Like, don't expect it to feel like the video games. Like, you're going to recognize the names of the races. You're going to recognize the names of the cards and the art on the cards. And yes, they're all right from the game. But you're not going to get that epic, oh my god, I conquered a galaxy and I spent hours doing it. No, this is quick filler game. Now, I don't have any real history with Master of Orion. I never, never played it. Um... I do notice a comment somewhere that, at least on some versions of the game, some of the races' graphics have been swapped. Yeah. So, name if you, if you are a Again, Moo fan... Again, if you care. Yeah, if you are a Moo fan, that might care. Uh, and also, uh, you know, this is called a board game, but the board is really just your resource tracker. Um, mm -hmm. It's a tableau builder with, with a resource tracker board for each player. Um, it's interesting that it's called, you know, it's called the board game when it's really not... <laughs> Well, Race um, for the Galaxy, uh, people still call it a board game, though it doesn't yeah, say yeah. it on the box. Well, that's the thing. It's it's, it's that, the, you know, putting it on the box there. You know, yeah. I, as someone who has now been enjoying Race for the Galaxy quite a bit, uh, I have to say it really does sound like quite a good game. Uh, and I wonder if not having any history with Moo myself, if I would enjoy it maybe more than you a little bit, at least yeah. out of the gate, because of that lack of association, I wouldn't be trying to connect it <laughs> back to that game. Um, I have to say, you know, Board Game Geek, it's got a solid seven. Um, oh, that's better than and, I would have thought. And reading, reading the actual comments and, and looking for the people who've actually put some thought into it, um, again, they're really saying it's sort of an easier to teach version of Race for the Galaxy, mm -hmm. very much in that vein. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it, it definitely looks like a strong, uh, a strong option. Yeah, no, it's it's a good game. Just ignore the fact it says Master of Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> I would still love to see it's the same complaint I had about the XCOM board game. It's a neat game, but it doesn't feel anything like playing XCOM. Right. Uh so what'd you get up to this week? So uh I took another run at Hogwarts, but this time it was a total rout. Uh <laughs> it was just my son and I, and 
By the time we lost the first location to the villains, we hadn't dispatched a single villain. Uh, we called it right then. Uh, the turning point I had talked about previously would have crushed us. Um, and it just wouldn't have been fun. Uh, it was a bad deal in part, uh, and I'm not sure if either of us was really into the game. I don't think we were sort of, you know, it was kind of a, oh, let's sit down and play something and we'll play, but we weren't focused on the game as well as having a bad deal. Um, and it was just better to walk away and call it a loss without trying to fight through playing what was going to be a crushing defeat. Uh, it's it's good to hear that you quit, actually. There's there's yeah. far too many gamers that, that fall for that lost time fallacy, right? Like, we started, we have to finish. No. We talked about that a lot during our teaching episode, right? Like, yeah. if you're doing a teaching game and everyone's got the rules, why not quit, start over, and start playing? Same thing, if you know a game's pointless, right? Especially a co-op game or yeah. something like that where you can't possibly win, there's no reason not to just stop and either start over or move on to something else. Yeah, you know, I don't want my son to, to get negative opinions of the game mm. simply because, you know, we had a bad run of it. You know, it happens. Uh, and I don't want him to not want to come back to it because he thinks about the last time he played, which mm -hmm. was horribly depressing. <laughs> right. Fair enough. Uh, up next for me is, uh, check out this title, The Ninth World, a skill-building game for Numenera. That's just, what the heck? That, that's terrible. Now, besides being long and making up a game mechanic on the spot, like it's something everyone should recognize, it's skill building? What, what's that mean? That wasn't on our list of 52 game mechanics. I don't remember that. Maybe we should add it, I guess. Uh, the part that bothers me the most about this title is that it says for Numenera. That implies that it's somehow an expansion or something for the pen and paper role-playing game Numenera. I, I played the game. It's not for Numenera. It's, it's a card game. It's set in the same setting as the RPG. It is a Numenera game, but it's not for Numenera. Like, why didn't they put a Numenera skill building game if they really wanted that skill building title? But anyway, uh, the title's odd, which, to be honest, I guess kind of fits because this is an odd game. It's it, it, and Numenera is odd, right? The whole point of Numenera is all about exploring the strange. Well, this is a strange game because it is a unique mesh of mechanics that isn't quite like anything else I own. And I gotta say, I've got a soft spot for unique games. Well, we haven't got it up on the channel yet, there will be an unboxing video for this at some mm -hmm. point, so you'll be able to see the uh, nice and unique design of it. Yeah, for one, it's a big tower, it's a yeah. cube. I didn't bring that one up for the, the back show, backdrop, I, I forgot it. My bad. Uh, so in this game, players pick a character, then together, you pick a region of the map you want to explore. Now this map is built into the box. It's kind of neat, you unfold it. Um, once you have a spot you want to explore, you lay out five destination cards uh, representing the interesting sites that are in that region. Each round, your party is gonna move to a new spot and then go through a series of actions. So the actions start off with scouting the area. This lets you explore the wilderness and mark things you found. So you're like, hey, I found this thing, no one else did. And that round, you get exclusive like use of that card, you only you've spotted it. The next round, anyone else can mark that card. So like the first time it's like, hey, I spotted weird ass zebra thing. And then next round it's like, oh, you didn't kill it yet, so I can spot that weird ass zebra thing. And trust me, Numenera has lots of weird ass zebra things. Uh, it's weird, that's a whole Numenera thing. So then the next thing you can do is tinker with ciphers and oddities. Uh, ciphers and oddities are the Numenera, they're weird bits of detrius that do funky things. Uh, you can try to get those cards. Um, next. After tinkering, you can try to charm allies, which start quests. After charming allies, you move on to combat. This is where you can fight things that are in town or attack creatures. Now, the neat part about attacking creatures in the wilderness is you have to have them marked, so you would have had to scout them before you can attack them. Neat mechanic. like It's a really interesting way to recreate that RPG exploration feel. Uh, the last thing you get to do is focus, which is to improve your skills, and that's where the whole skill building thing comes up. Now, the funky part is that every single one of these phases is an auction of all things. Each round, players blind bid skill cards by putting them on the table and covering them up with another card, and then reveal, and the player who bid the most gets to do the action first. So if it's in the scouting round, whoever bid the most scouting gets to go first and scout first. They then spend the amount they bid on doing stuff. So if they bid three, they get to do three scouting things. So they can draw three cards from the wilderness, or they can mark two things and draw another card. 
now, most of this is done to defeat cards or place take cards and put them in your tableau, uh, which is what you do with the cipher. Now, doing all this earns you valor. Uh, the player with the most valor points wins. Now, to bid in these auctions, you're using skill cards. Now, every player only has five and never get any more. So this is not a deck builder. There are four different or five different types of cards, right? One for each phase. So there's a scout card, combat card, focus card, and so on. Each player starts with two skills at level one and three generic cards. During the focus phase, you can replace those. So you can either replace the generic cards with skill cards, or you can upgrade the skill cards to the next level. I, it's it's funky. Like you, you, I can't describe it well enough. You have to see it to pl to to really grasp how this works. Now, the game we played is competitive, but you can play cooperative. Um, at this point, I've only played once, so I don't want to say too much. Like I'm not ready for a full review, but that one play was enough to tell me that this game is unique. And as I said, I dig unique. Well, and finding a unique game when you've got a thousand or so different games under your belt is saying something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true. Uh, so, after the uh, defeat at Hogwarts Battle, my son wanted to go do something else. He was just he, you know, he wasn't he wasn't upset that he's never going to play again. But it was just kind of like, oh, well, that stinks. I'm going to go watch YouTube. Uh, so I decided it was time to try a solo game on of DC the DC Deck Builder. Uh, I've been wanting to try this a few times, but usually if, it, if the game comes out, the kids want to play too. So this was my chance to try a solo play. Now, in the base game, normally you're playing multiple hands mm -hmm. to, to do solo. But because Crisis is a co-op, you can actually play single player against the game. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried that variant. Now, I'm not sure if it's because I'm finally getting to grok the games and I've, I've learned the cards, but I crushed it. Mm -hmm. Um... And if I try again, I'm going to have to, I, I definitely need to start trying some of the um, ways they have of, of upping the difficulty. There's actually a checklist of ways to up, up uh, to both increase and decrease the difficulty okay. in the, uh, in the rule books. Um, but I'm, you know, 95% sure I didn't go uni uh, go extreme on it. <laughs> um, but it, and it was pretty easy. So it's, it's interesting and I, and I want to explore it a bit more. Yeah, easy is not something you want in co-ops in general. You want co-ops to be, you want to feel yeah. like you worked for it, right? I find most of them are actually almost more fun to lose because you're like, oh, it's so close. I got to try yeah. again. If you well, can just blow again, it away. I, I'm still not sure whether, you know, was it a good deal and, I, and I've yeah. just gotten good at it? Or it also could just be the fact that the solo is easier because you don't have those extra rounds of, of things. Right. Uh, also, one thing for certain in Crisis is um, there is a requirement for cooperation to defeat events. Uh, and sometimes I've found that has been our, our toughest part of the whole crisis event mm -hmm. is getting rid of those events uh, through working together. Uh, but it's, even though they do make some accommodations, if you are a single player, you have to do this instead. Um, it was still easier than, than trying to right. get through it with the kids. I gotta say uh, props to... Uh... Uh, cryptozoic yeah yep. props to cryptozoic for putting in sliding difficulty that's a good thing to see yeah no it's great in the, like right in there in the manual it's it's a, there's a checklist and it says you can try these seven things if you want to up your difficulty and if you're having a hard time here's these three things you can true down here cool that'll, uh, that'll make things easier for you nice touch so saturday both Deanna and i headed out to the cg realm where we got in three games now, we started off with more Masters of Ryan. Uh, I really wanted to show this game off after playing on Monday. Now, the big thing this game taught me is that, wow, is there a big difference in how you end up playing the game once you know the cards? Uh, knowing that there are cards that are going to give you points for organizing your systems in a certain way really had a big effect on how I played the game. And also knowing that gray cards can always be exploited to let you draw four cards and keep three was also very useful. Uh, that just mainly told me this is definitely a game that rewards multiple plays. And that is something I usually see as a strong positive. Yeah, no, actually, we've been finding the same thing in DC. Knowing what's in that deck and mm -hmm. what possible combos exist and allowing you to think ahead and, and it really shapes the play in an enjoyable way. Yeah, same thing with Race for the Galaxy, right? Like, eventually, when you first start playing, you're like, why would I ever want to explore five? And then once you play it a few times, you're like, oh, wait, I need either this card, this card, or this card. It's time to go fishing. 
So after Masters of Ryan, the group split up a bit. Uh, we were down to only three players at that point. So we decided to play Sagrada. Uh, it's been some time since I played this dice drafter, and I gotta say, I enjoyed it. It, it was nice to get that back to the table. Uh, still, the more I play, the more I enjoy it. I really dig how variable that game is. Like, I, I think I've mentioned every time I talk about Sagrada, the fact that you randomize what gets scored every game has such an impact on that game. I, I love that variability. Just, it changes the feel every time. Though I gotta admit, I didn't play very well. Um... The pattern I picked for my player board was not a good choice based on what tools were out. But I do dig that I recognize that mistake, right? Like, it did take me half the game to make the connection, but it's good to go, I know what I did wrong. I like games where I can see that. I can look back on it and go, oh, if I had only done this. To me, that's a sign of a good game. Yeah. To be fair, people come here for your advice on what games to play, not how to play them. That's <laughs> true enough. I, I, I'll give you my Azul Sintra strategy guide. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, how to come in last in Sintra by Mo Tuzano. That'll be our hottest YouTube video yet. <laughs> uh, we finished off the night at the CG Realm with more Villages of Valeria. I talked about this one last week uh, when I reviewed the Monuments and Guild Halls expansion. Uh, actually, that was back in February, so it was a little longer ago than I first thought. Um, this was a learning game for one of the players, uh, and I considered pulling out the expansions, but I'm pleased to say that no, I, d I don't think you need to. Like, these expansions aren't overly complicated. As long as you're playing with someone who knows games, right? Which we were. We were playing with an experienced game player. I wasn't breaking this out on, on a noob. Uh, well, these expansions do add some complexity to the game. It's nothing an experienced gamer would be overwhelmed with. Now, we did find one small annoyance with the event part of Guild Halls. It didn't come up our first play because I was just adding the expansion for the first time. And that's that you now have work at the start of the game. Uh, for setup, you have to go through the deck and find all the events, which don't have a different back. So you got to kind of watch for them. There's no like bright, hey, this is an event. Um, you got to pull them out, shuffle the deck, pull out a bunch of cards. I think it's 12. Then shuffle the events back in and then put those 12 cards back on top. Now, it's not much, like really, of all things to complain about, first world problems and all that, but it's more work than normally. I open the box, I shuffle the deck, and I go, boom, let's go. Uh, overall, though, Village of Valeria is still good. Uh, everyone I show it to, I taught it to a new player, Justin. He really, excuse me, really enjoyed it. Um, most of the expansion material this time actually was very seamless. Uh, we were very aware we were using the expansions for the first time because they were coming off the pile of shame last time, whereas this time, you know what, I didn't even notice the new cards. Like, they were just mixed in with the rest. So if any guild cards even came up, I didn't notice it, which is, to me, a good sign because it just added on. If, if new characters came out, they might have, they might not have. Now, Monuments, on the other hand, does still really stick out. Uh, what was neat to see, though, is this game was very different from our last because most players had built or were in the process of building two monuments this time. So it wasn't the same as, oh, everyone had to build one monument. This played out very different. Monuments were a bigger part of the game. Well, it's good to hear that it's uh, holding on as a solid play, even after it gets back to the table. And yeah, it's really nice to hear when, when you know that you've thrown that expansion in there and you forget about it. It just yeah. It's part of the game. It, the natural feel of it uh, is nice. Yeah, that is what I like to see. So the rest of my week was uh, Board Game Arena, and there are a lot of it. <laughs> the only <laughs> thing I'm actually going to mention, though, is I did get sucked back into Libertalia. Ah, all um, right. They kept inviting me, and I, 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 hit, a, I, hit, a, I hit accept. Um, and I even knowingly, I figured I'd give it another try. And I have to say, I'm starting to get it. Um, I, 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 I understand needs... why it's still better at the table. There's, yeah. that, there's that interaction with players that would make a difference. But uh, I, I'm starting to understand the day-night mechanic better, which is, is I think, really the main reason why I was getting crushed that first time is if you take advantage of that night mechanic, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's back into the rotation. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to still stay away from that one. To the point I should get rid of my physical copy because it's, it's social deduction. When you play real life and everyone knows how I feel about social deduction, yep. <laughs> I, it's, it's one I probably should get rid of. The, the thing is, if, it, if I do a pirate-themed game night, it's perfect. That's why I tend to keep it. And how many so of those have you done? <laughs> uh, <laughs> at least six. <laughs> at least. Uh, there's some good pictures from the CG realm. People actually dressed up. It was pretty yeah. good. 
Yeah, it's it's one of the we need a theme. People like pirates, superheroes. I don't know. That's all people ever be able. To, and then race games. That's the other one that comes up. Oh, zombies. That's the other one. So yeah, that's like four different ones. But after doing like that rotation of four, it's like I don't know Nitzia games and people are like what what's that? So no, it's pirates seem to be the easy one. We never do it on like talk to fire pirate day or whatever. But I don't know. It's easy theme, and I have pirate games. So that's it for our last week. So a quick look at the less shame, more game pile of shame count. Uh, Master of Orion and the Ninth World were both pile of shame games. So the count goes down by two. The pile of shame. All right. So All right. now that we've talked about what we played since the last update, is there anything you're excited to get to the table next week? Well, another expansion for DC came in. That's the Legion of Superheroes. Uh, right. And we finally got delivery of the Cartoon Network deck builder from Mass Drop. Are you planning on meshing them? You're going to try it? Um, we'll talk about that next week. All right. Sounds good. Speaking of next week, as a teaser, I have already played two games of Builders of Blankenberg. One of them with a new expansion that's currently unannounced, not on Board Game Geek, and only at the prototype stage. Uh, so you'll hear about that next week. The big thing, though, is that obviously Breakout Con is this weekend. Not only this weekend, it's tomorrow. Like, we're, we're hopping on a train and heading up to Toronto tomorrow morning. Uh, so there is some stuff I've got scheduled. I plan on playing Sentinel Comics. Uh, that'll be Friday night. That is a new RPG based on the Sentinel, a uh, new superhero RPG based on the Sentinels of the Multiverse uh, world and board game. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Saturday, I'm going to be playing High Plains Samurai. I've also got Tales from the Loop, and I'm ending the night with Dungeon World. Sunday, I was planning to play Protocol, but Major Kayla in the chat has warned me that the DM unfortunately had to cancel due to weather. So I guess I'm not going to get to try Jim Pinto's system, even though I interact with Jim all the time, and I thought it'd be cool to try. I am very sorry to hear you will not be there when. It would have been awesome to actually game with you. Uh, added to that, though, I've got lots of time uh, still freed up, so I expect some board gaming and some pickup games as well. So we're nearing the very end of the show. Let's take one final stop in at the lobby and see what's going on downstairs. So, uh, Shadzar's pointing out that, uh, it's again, he's not, a, he's not a big fan of the legacy concept, and, and he's pointing <laughs> out that you can't unstick a sticker. Uh, and when, when you've got rules that aren't clear... And, uh, you know, it's, it's too easy to, un to, 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 you know, follow the, the poorly designed rule book and stick something down there. And once you've done that, um, you know, it's on the board, whether or not you were supposed to or not. This has been addressed by Isaac, which is why you can buy the Gloomhaven removable sticker set for about 10 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So because <laughs> he designed it badly and you can accidentally put stickers on, you can give him 10 extra dollars. Mm. No, it's actually so people can replay the game. Right. If you don't rip up the cards like I do, ha, ah, people who get upset that I rip up my $140 <laughs> game, I paid for it. I rip up cards. Yep. I love the fact that you can't remove stickers. That's what I love about legacy games. Well, no, I can I, go on about it. I get that, but the problem is when there's a problem in the game book that, yes. could, that could be having you have put the wrong sticker down because of a bad design, that's where yeah. I have a problem. I gotta admit, putting the extra sticker on in this one, if you follow the rules, if you read the front of the scenario book, it's pretty clear about that. It's just the fact that people see... Oh, it's the same thing I did. People see the number and they're like, oh, that must be a sticker. No, right. like it's it's pretty clear about if numbers show up in scenario flavor text, they are just flavor to remind you of the location that's being talked about, basically, is what it boils down to. And it is clear. It's in there. It just It's a 54-page book. You're going to miss some stuff. Yep. And I gotta admit, the non-removable stickers are pretty removable because we made some mistakes ourselves. But that's just a matter of not lining things up right and me being picky about making the board look good. Uh, Ancient Games pointed out that uh, we said Masters of Orion a few times. And no, no, it's just master. one. It's Master yes. of Orion. Yes, um, Masters of Orion is all about big buff dudes fighting in space. <laughs> uh, Major Kellen pointed out that her Kickstarter for Miskatonic University just arrived. So that's what she's going to be doing after the con. Oh, that's cool. Oh, there's so many RPGs. Like, I, I felt so bad that I couldn't back uh, Brett's Kickstarter there, right? Avalon, and I couldn't back Tracy's Kickstarter. 
uh, for Ironetta. I just I don't have the money this year. It's just it's not there. I think it would be pretty awesome. Yep. And uh, Major Kale has been invited to her first Legacy game, Betrayal at, ha- at the House on Haunted Hill. Legacy. Yeah, that one looks good. I I'm curious. See, I don't like Betrayal at House on the Hill. I'm I'm not a fan. I played some bad scenarios, and I played scenarios with people, and yeah, it didn't go good. But Betrayal Legacy does look pretty cool. Right now we got Gloomhaven. I don't plan on starting anything else anytime soon. I gotta admit I've been tempted by Charterstone. Charterstone keeps being on sale, and I've heard some really good things about that one. Overall, I gotta thank the chat tonight. You guys have been fantastic. I've seen an awful lot of stuff going by, great conversations going on while we're talking. It is appreciated. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark joined Phil, Chris, Bob, and Candom every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Brian Kurtz, thanks. Graham Barnett, thanks for today's question. Joe Swick, thank you. Jeff Seuss, thank you. William Fisher, thanks. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Danielle Thomas, thank you. Yes, Goujon, thanks. Andrew Daisy, thank you. And one final shout out to our sponsor, Quiver Time. Uh, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. So the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek under guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers in YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.